before we begin i once again request uh, the audience to please keep their phone in silent mode to preserve the sanctity of this wonderful and momentous occasion Good morning everyone. A warm welcome to the 29th leadership le lecture being organized by TAPI Management Institute TAPME, a constituent unit of the Manipal Academy of Higher Education. I am Jeevan J. Arakel, a member of the faculty community at TAPME. Inspired by the life and work of our founder, Padma Bhushan Awardee, late Sri Thonse Anand Pai, TAPME is energized by the motto, where learning is for life. Since its founding in the year 1980, the Institute continues to stand tall in the fast-changing landscape of management education in India. The leadership lecture series at TAPME is an invaluable opportunity for our community to listen and learn from luminaries drawn from government, business, academia, civil society, and the arts. It is indeed a high honor and extraordinary privilege for the Institute to host our chief guest for the 29th leadership lecture at TAPME Manipal. May I now request the chief guest and dignitaries to kindly light the lamp and pay tributes to our founder.
Thank you, sirs. Kindly be seated for the invocation of the Mahe Anthem. Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. M. D. Venkatesh, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Very good morning, everybody, and warm greetings to all of you from Manipal Academy of Higher Education, an institution of eminence deemed to be university. Distinguished Chief Guest, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister, Government of India, Dr. H. S. Balal, Pro Chancellor Mahe, Pro Vice Chancellors, Heads of the Institutions, Heads of the Departments, Invited Guests, Press and the Media, and my dear students. 
It's my honor and privilege to be delivering the welcome address today for the 29th leadership lecture of TAPME to be delivered by our esteemed chief guest, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister, Government of India. TFI Management Institute is a constituent unit of Manipal Academy of Higher Education, a deemed to be university, recognized as an institution of eminence by Government of India. TAPME owes its genesis to the efforts of founder Padma Bhushan Awardee, late Sri Tonse Anantapai, a luminary committed to institution building and public service. In the year 2009, when TAPME completed 25 years of its existence, the leadership lecture series was started to commemorate this landmark achievement. On this occasion, thought leaders from different sections of the society are invited to share their vision, expertise, and achievements with the students of TAPME and other students of the Manipal institutions to inspire them to take leadership roles in their quest to build this nation. The past luminaries who have delivered this distinguished lecture series are Honorable Sri Nitin Gadkariji, Sri Ratan Tata, Sri Vinod Rai, IAS, Sri Salman Kurshid, Dr. Y.V. Reddy, Sri Varun Gandhi, Dr. Satyapal Singh, etc. Carrying forward the legacy of our founder, late Dr. T.M. Pai, a visionary doctor, banker, and educationist, Mahe continues his journey towards excellence following the core values, honesty, integrity, transparency, teamwork, and human touch in the true spirit of nationalism and to contribute to nation building. In line with this, it's our proud privilege to have amongst us today Dr. S. Jai Shankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister, Government of India, to deliver the 29th leadership lecture of TAPME on the topic of India in the Amrit Kal. Dr. Jai Shankar has served India with great distinction as a diplomat, ambassador, and presently as Minister of External Affairs. His wisdom, scholarship, and diplomatic skills are unparalleled under, under his dynamic leadership he has taken Indian diplomacy to the next level with many path-breaking initiatives. Sir, on behalf of our Chancellor, Dr. Ramdas Pai, President Mahe Trust, Dr. Ranjan Pai, Pro-Chancellor, Dr. H.S. Balal, and all the faculty and students of Mahe, I extend a very, very warm welcome to you, sir. I also extend a very warm welcome to our Pro-Chancellor of MAHE, Dr. H.S. Balal, the Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Heads of the Institutions of MAHE, invited guests, faculty and staff colleagues, special invitees, students and members of the media to this event. So we eagerly await your thought-provoking lecture. Thank you very much and Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. I now request our Pro Vice Chancellor, Management, Law, Humanities, and Social Sciences, Dr. Madhuveer Raghavan, to kindly introduce our chief guest. Good morning, everybody. The India way now especially would be to be more of a shaper rather than an abstainer. India seeks to be a stabilizing rather than a disruptive emerging power. India's desire to be a standard bearer of the South, characterized by an extraordinary diaspora of human capital, shall be an aspirational model for other South Asian countries to emulate. Dr. S. Jai Shankar, in dialogue, with the Observer Research Foundation. Distinguished Chief Guest, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister, Government of India, respected Pro Chancellor and Trustee Mahe, Dr. H. S. Balal, respected Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. M. T. Venkatesh, Pro Vice Chancellors, Registrar, other university officials, special invitees, Professor Madhav Das Nalapath, 
Professor of Geopolitics and Inesco P. Sharat Mahe, Dr. Seshadri Chari, other dignitaries, faculty and staff colleagues, friends and faculty of constituent units of Manipal University, members of the media, and students. Before I give my welcome or introduce the chief guest, I would like, I would request the Honorable External Affairs Minister to please come up to the dais. It's a little longer introduction, but I think I should do this. Dr. Subramaniam Jai Shankar. Man plans and God laughs. The usual understanding is that God laughs because he's not going to give you exactly what you want, meaning it'll be different from what you desire. When you want it, meaning it might be delayed. And how you want it, meaning it could be lesser than expected. In our case, we planned and God smiled. We deeply desired Dr. Jay Shankar to be our guest for the day, and here he is with us today in this beautiful student town of Manipal. Well, you will tell me at the end of the session how it is to take in, if I may, the full Jay Shankar effect. The task I have at hand today is that I am to welcome Dr. Jay Shankar and introduce him. Please tell me. How does one welcome somebody who already occupies your heart and mind space? <laughs> to top it, I'm required to introduce him. You know how I feel right now? I feel like having to introduce Michael Jackson just before his concert. Here are some interesting statistics. Dr. Jay Shankar has 2.4 million, 2.4 million Twitter followers, 84,000 Facebook followers, 771,000 followers on Instagram. But given that Dr. Jay Shankar is a thorough diplomat, he should be able to sit through this formality without letting his smile drop. Since I mentioned formality, Dr. Jay Shankar, please let me read out the approved bio by the government of India. I could do it in many number of ways. I could do it like how a school student would do it. I could dramatize the whole thing. I'll keep it fairly straightforward, and then I'll get to the real speech. Dr. S. Jay Shankar is India's External Affairs Minister since May 30, 2019. He is a member of the Upper House, the Rajya Sabha of India's Parliament from the state of Gujarat. He was Foreign Secretary from 2015 to 18, Ambassador to United States, 13 to 15, China, 2009 to 13, Singapore, 2007 to 9, and Czech Republic, 2000 to 2004. He has also served on other diplomatic assignments and embassies in Moscow, Colombo, Budapest, and Tokyo, as well as the Ministry of External Affairs and the President's Secretariat. He was also the President of Global Corporate Affairs at Tata Sons Private Limited from May 2018. Dr. S. Jay Shankar is a graduate of St. Stephen's College at the University of Delhi. He has a Master's in Political Science and an MPhil in PhD in International Relations from JNU Delhi. He's a recipient of the Padma Shri Award in 2019 and has written a widely acclaimed book, best-selling book, The India Way, Strategies for an Uncertain World, which was published in 2020, unquote. For, fault me for anything else, but I think I'm a reasonably good observer. I noticed something about Dr. Jay Shankar. I don't know whether you noticed it. Number one, he's been a selected public servant. Number two, He's been an elected public servant. Number three, he's been a nominated public servant. And from this pinnacle of public or national service, he enters the pinnacle of private sector. He has been at the House of Tatas. As the Tata Group's president in global corporate affairs, Dr. Jay Shankar was responsible for the group's global corporate affairs, international strategy development, overseeing Tata Sons international offices, and to help them strengthen the business presence and positioning in the respective global perspectives. Now, would you please appreciate his education? Chemistry graduate, PhD in international relations. I also read, not his thesis, but I read in the media, that his PhD thesis was in nuclear diplomacy. 
is one of the finest research works in diplomatic studies in India, where the rare art and craft of geopolitical negotiation tactics and skills are brought out outstandingly. Any surprises here that he goes on to set up the India way of concocting impossible formulae, remember he's a chemist, in the international relations diplomacy. We have heard that an enemy's enemy is our friend. That was Chanakya's abiding dictum that stayed with us. But if it's not a state secret, Dr. Jayashankar, maybe please know how India can be the most trusted friend of two mutually sworn enemies. Have you, sir, just turned our admiration for an understanding of Chanakya on its head? The India way surely needs to be explained more, and more, and more, at least till it becomes the basis for a new Kutaniti. Dr. Jay Shankar can be frequently seen countering the US, China, and any other geographical entity trying to browbeat India. Tell me, except for India, how many countries are there which have been approached by both Russia and Ukraine for negotiating peace building? In November 2022, during a joint press conference along with the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergey Lavrov, Dr. Jay Shankar praised Russia's exceptionally steady and time-tested partner of India and advocated a return to dialogue and peace between Russia and Ukraine. I'm certain you all want me out of here so that his speech begins, but I'm not giving up just yet. Dr. Jay Shankar is a keen reader, researcher, and a lover of Mahabharata. So students, here is your chance. I'm happy to be presenting your go-to person for any clarification of the great epic Mahabharata. Dr. Jay Shankar says, quote, Asserting national interests and securing strategic goals is the dharma of a nation, as it was of an individual warrior in Mahabharata. India needs to summon the will proven to address concerns that are upon us, rather than rationalize inaction by highlighting its costs." Unquote. Before I conclude, I feel I should share with you that other than in English and Tamil, his, which is his mother tongue, Dr. Jay Shankar can understand and make himself understood in his wife's tongue, which is Japanese, his neighbor's tongues, Urdu and Chinese, and one more language, Hungarian. Sir, it occurs to me that I should request you to use your knowledge of Hungarian to tell on India's behalf an old, rich, and opinionated man of a Hungarian descent to mute his dirty mind. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my proud privilege to present Dr. S. Jai Shankar India's very own excellent affairs minister. Join me in welcoming Dr. Jai Shankar with a very big round of applause. Michael Jackson is a very tough act to follow, ask Janet Jackson. <laughs> so, respected pro-chancellor, respected vice-chancellor, pro-vice-chancellors, distinguished academic personalities, faculty, students, including international students, media. Uh, let me really say how much I have looked forward to this visit. Uh, it's been a very busy morning, but everything that I've seen impresses me enormously. And as I keep saying, I think probably for the fourth or fifth time today, uh, I wish I had the opportunity to be a student. Uh, I, I'm not sure there's a post PhD course, but I'm willing to give it a try. So uh, today, uh, I would like to speak to you uh, on a subject which I think is particularly important for the young people, not just of this country, but for the young people of the world. And that is the subject of India in Amrit Kal. So first, let me explain to you what that means. We have just marked 75 years of our independence. These 75 years have been years of considerable achievements, many challenges. Also, if you are honest, uh, quite a few shortcomings. But 
all said and done we have come through what was a very very challenging phase of the post independence uh, period as we reflect on that we are now looking at a period ahead a period which prime minister modi has urged us to think of amrit kal a period of 25 years so that when this nation in its present form reaches a centenary of its independence we can strive to be a developed nation we can become a leading power and the reason i picked that topic is that all of you students these 25 years are your years to realize this dream so what i am going to talk about in a way is what are our expectations of all of you now what has made this possible i believe because you know it's it's the first time actually we are talking not just of a term in office of a government of even a decade of a uh, progress or aspirations we are talking a full generation and more we are talking of an era and we can talk today of an era because the achievements of the last decade have positioned us to do so that this country actually has and and the last decade has been a very difficult one uh, and I, that's a subject on which i will also dilate upon that the achievements of the last decade today have given us the platform to actually contemplate an era to plan for an era to strategize for an era and obviously to aspire uh, for very big goals uh, on the centenary of our independence so let me start with this decade itself uh i don't know if some of you had a chance if you have not i would recommend it uh to watch prime minister modi yesterday at the india today conclave you know what he did was instead of talking about 75 years he said i want you to think of the last 75 days what have we achieved in 75 days he said it i don't want to repeat it but i would really urge you to look at it but i want to talk about the last decade and i'm talking about the last decade not so much as as a report card but as a explanation of the platform which will allow us really to contemplate the amrit kal the 25 years ahead of us the first big achievement i think has been a dramatic reduction in the intensity and the rate and the extent of poverty in india that it is it, this is not something anecdotal though obviously all of us see it around us it is it's validated by research and studies but what we have seen actually is not just a decline in poverty at at an unprecedented rate but an increase an enhancement in what we consider to be the basics that an indian citizen uh, should get now a lot of that is reflected in the human development indices in the achievement of sustainable development goals and here if you see the the 17 sustainable development goals have in the last decade been expressed in the form of national campaigns national campaigns with which each one of you would be familiar in some form you know swachh bharat बेटी पढ़ाओ बेटी बचाओ डिजिटल इंडिया स्टार्टअप इंडिया ईच ऑफ दिस जल जीवन मिशन ईच ऑफ दिस इज एक्चुअली अ नेशनल एफर्ट टूडे टू अचीव वॉट इज अ ग्लोबल गोल बाय द एंड ऑफ दिस डेकेट एंड आर प्रोग्रेस विल एक्चुअली इन अ वे बी अ डिटर्मिनिंग फैक्टर फॉर द वर्ल्ड सक्सेस एंड वी हैव मेड कमेंडेबल प्रोग्रेस Uh, in fact 
if you look at the scale of what we have achieved, many of our programs actually cover multiple times the population of a country. You know, during COVID, uh, because a lot of people went home from their place of work, a lot of, especially people in the informal sector, were left without support. We took the extraordinary measure of providing food and financial support. Now, I don't know whether these figures are something which come readily to your mind, but just in case, I want you to understand it. 800 million people for the last two and a half years have been getting food support. And this has actually been a key factor in dealing with the social consequences of the pandemic. 415 million people get money in their bank accounts. Just think about these numbers. 800 million means more than Europe and North America put together. 415 million is, is half the size of, well, little less, 40% the size of Africa, but the size of Europe. Every program that we have done today, what used to be done in hundreds of thousands or even early millions today, we are looking at hundreds of millions. You know, there is uh, today about, uh, I would say, if you, if you were to take uh, the various pension benefits which are given, roughly one third the country already gets, draws pension in some form from, the, from uh, the government. Any of these programs, you know, there is a program, again, many of you would be aware of, giving up, fire, you know, giving gas cylinders to replace firewood. The number of beneficiaries of this is the size of the population of Germany, 80 million people. If you look at, there's a program to build houses, it's called Pradhan Mantri Avaz Yojana. 30 million people, 30 million houses have been built in the last few years. 30 million in a family size of 4.8, which is our average, is bigger than the population of Japan. So just think about it, the scale of what is happening in India today. We are at a, at a per capita income of $2,000, actually creating a social welfare society. A society that feeds its people, a society which gives health access, including free health access today to more than half the population of India. A society whose literacy rates, whose education capabilities have gone up. A society which is today looking at housing and home ownership as a basic right. So this is really a very, very different India in the making. Now, it's not just, you know, the, the uh, socio-economic achievements uh, of the last few years. Look around you. Look around you in Manipal as you travel maybe, maybe to Mangaluru, uh, when you go to Bengaluru, as you go to other parts of India. Contemplate the infrastructure changes that all around us today, you know, you could be traveling on that same road six months later, it looks very, very different. You could be going to the same airport in fact, I can see Mangalore Airport is undergoing a transformation. So, the infrastructure progress. You know, there was many years ago this movie called Planes, Trains and Automobiles. Some of you may remember it. Uh, if you look today at travel by plane, travel by train, travel by automobile, it's a very, very different landscape and a very different platform on which we are navigating. And what is the secret of our ability to suddenly ramp up our performance? The key to that, to my mind, has been our extraordinary digital delivery. That we have created a digital platform which has transformed governance, which has dramatically cut down what are called very politely as leakages, which has allowed these these schemes which I'm talking about, 
this hundreds of millions of delivery that you see. It could be to the farmer for their crop. It could be to the vendor for their unsecured loan. It could be to women to do their businesses uh, out of home or in the neighborhood. And it is actually this change, this digitally driven change, obviously with, with a vision and leadership to apply that, that is actually bringing about what I would call both a silent democratic revolution and actually a democratizing of technology. Now, obviously, it has other benefits. I will come to that. One of them is to connect all of us. The other is to create a global awareness, uh, which too, I believe, is very central to the transformation of India and obviously for a generation that will live and work through the Amrit Kal. These changes that I speak about are also visible, I think, in the field of education. I am in one of the premier educational institutions of this country. And, you know, it's not just the growth of existing uh, institutions. Uh, if you look at the number of medical colleges, nursing colleges, technology institutions, IT institutions, the manner in which today we are uh, prepared to re-look at the mode of education and skills impartation. That whole family too is undergoing a change. And not least, a big part of that change is something called Make in India. Make in India as an expression of our ability to manufacture. Manufacture not just simple products, but high value goods. Make in India even as a mindset. Make it, you know, there is a term, Atma Nirbhar Bharat, or many of you would be familiar with it. That confidence that we have to find our solutions, we have the capability of finding our solutions. And it is actually, you know, pulling together a lot of the other factors, the socio-economic changes, the infrastructure, the talent, the skill, all of this gets actually pulled in to create Make in India. Now, obviously there are debates in our countries about a lot of this, there should be. There are even debates whether our politics should be Make in India, but I don't want to go into it. The bottom line is this. You are asking yourself, here's the foreign minister, there's the build-up he gave me, why is this coming, guy coming and talking to us about what's happening in domestic economy, domestic space? And I'll tell you the link, which is so important for me. As a foreign minister, how seriously I am taken, how effectively I perform, is a direct derivative of how we have done at home. You cannot do averagely at home and then be hugely respected abroad. It is our ability, it is our capability today. There is a term in our business, it's called comprehensive national power. So all that I have described to you, the human development indices, the infrastructure, the capabilities, the manufacturing, all of this is actually a feed into comprehensive national power. And we have seen at times that when our comprehensive national power is lacking, no amount of smart diplomacy is going to compensate for it. Because the rest of the world is not stupid. They, 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 know, they know the pluses and minuses, the strengths and weaknesses of every other competing country. The second, of course, why I am uh, stressing the domestic achievements is there is also a direct responsibility on foreign policy today to seek from the world the relationships and the, uh, and the transactions which will accelerate national development at home. So if you look at the foreign policy of 
a lot of the East Asian and Southeast Asian countries. One way in which many of them progressed was actually by seeking technology, best practices, capital from, from partners abroad. So foreign policy is not something which is divorced from what happens at home. It is both a reflection of what happens at home, it is also a driver of what happens at home. So to my mind, these are actually very integrated facets of what I would uh, regard as a good foreign policy. And finally, a lot of what I've described in terms of developments at home are directly relevant to all of you because this equips you to face the world. It actually not just makes you aware of what the world is. It is actually your better access starting with health and nutrition and, you know, uh, uh, social uh, and economic requirements to your ta skills and your talent, to your creativity, to your ability to actually translate that into something meaningful. All of this actually equips you to face the world and that is really why it is so essential when we look at the Amrit Khan. So let's think of the 25 years ahead of us and ask yourself, today you are in your, let's say, early 20s, what awaits you? What awaits you in this world? What kind of world is it that you should be preparing for? All that I have spoken about, what difference could it make to you? So I would urge you to look at four aspects of the world that awaits you. The first is the world as a global workplace. A global workplace because if you see where the skills and talents of the world are and where the demands for it are, the gaps are very visible. Demographics and demand are not congruent. In fact, in many areas they are not even convergent. So, Today, how do we prepare you for this global workplace, which will surely come? It's already, you know, in, in the last, I'd say, three years, four years, we see a great interest on the part of countries who are otherwise very insular in actually reaching mobility partnerships with us. Even at the beginning of this year, I had done one with Austria. Uh, last d December, I signed a mobility partnership with Germany. In the last few years, we have done this with the UK, with France, with Denmark, with uh, uh, Portugal. Uh, even Japan, which has got quite a conservative policy, has something called specialized skills workers. So there is today this, this uh, move towards uh, actually integrating, because of technology, the global workplace and that will require the talent and skill of India that all of you represent. To think of your future prospects, not just necessarily in narrower confines, but actually with a much broader global uh, uh, vision, global aspiration in mind. So related to that is of course the global tech place. Now, why do I call it a tech place? Because the digital era, the digital era has actually not just revolutionized technology. It has also revolutionized politics. It has revolutionized international relations. Because people are now increasingly aware and therefore concerned about where their, their data resides, who harvests the data, who monetizes the data, who deploys the data. And the digital era, therefore, has put a premium on the concepts of trust and transparency. Every country, every player is not the same. And it is, therefore, important today that we position ourselves with our, because at the end of the day, 
we are a country we are a society we are a people who are trusted in the world i will i will also talk about that so how do we prepare today for the digital tech place i just give you one example the hottest subject today in world politics is not about oil it's not even about military it is about chips who is making chips who's controlling that ability to make chips who is doing the high end who is doing the big volumes and in fact if you look at some of the big economic issues challenges the world has faced it is actually due to the shortage of chips now if you we just had recently the american commerce secretary in india and we were talking to her about it today there is actually a shortage of tens of thousands of chip designers and engineers and as this industry rearchitectures itself moves to more trusted locations there is an opportunity there just staring us in the face already you know when i was in the us i was told by the american semiconductor association that according to their knowledge there are already more than 40000 indians who are actually working on chip designing in india so i i just give that to you as one example of this global tech place that awaits us then there is a larger challenge this is a challenge of supply chains you know when the covid came and uh, i was one of the ministers who was part of the team which was tasked to deal uh, with the covid we naturally much of our focus was on vaccines on the vaccines came a little later immediately on the ppes the mass production the isolation centers but there was another part which directly affected my my domain and that was how the supply chains got disrupted that what we assumed the entire world assumed was an uninterrupted infallible smooth working of supply chains because of globalization so it took one virus to put that entire belief into question and we all struggled now some of us maybe thought a little bit further ahead for example we took that decision even during the lockdown when you all remember the lockdown you know how uh, how uh, you know uh, severe it was even during the lockdown we actually kept the food supplies to the gulf going because it was for them an absolutely vital supply chain and it has helped us today the fact that we took that decision but the world has learned from that experience that it is actually over invested in a limited geography if something happens it could happen due to pandemic it could happen due to policy it could happen due to i don't know tomorrow maybe a climate event so the biggest challenge today for the world is how to de-risk the global economy how to have more redundant resilient reliable supply chains and that too is an opportunity waiting to happen because today we have a government which has the vision to see that challenge which has the courage to make the commitments to meet it so we have i mean if you would see the the flow of manufacturing companies and i think the probably the case which is most touted is that of apple you know the fact that uh, you know apple and its manufacturing chain has chosen to come to india that the iphone 14 will be produced that is a sign of changing times and it's a sign of changing times because it reflects the easier to do business it reflects the improvements in talents and skills it takes into account the better infrastructure that there is and the sense of entrepreneurship which is really creating actually small and medium vendors which are very necessary as part of any manufacturing chain 
and the fourth aspect of the world that awaits you one which i am working towards uh, and you referred to sir as well which is to try to create culturally a more level playing field i say that because you know the economic rebalancing is happening every day you know the top 20 economies of the world today are not what they were 20 years ago even less so what they were 40 years ago and as the economics changes as the distribution of prosperity changes the politics will change but cultures are harder to change so one part of international relations is really whose narrative whose practice whose judgment these are also real contests and they they can often be contests with very direct personal implications for you i mean in a world which i foresee of increasing mobility it would be natural for people to expect that they have a place of faith where they are that they are allowed to dress or carry items of their personal beliefs that the yardsticks of judgment you know sometimes even of what is a family and how do we deal with each other these are also very deeply cultural so how do we actually uh, how do we uh, actually deal with uh, this this uh, set of issues uh, i think is is something which is uh, going to be very very important and i would uh, really uh, urge uh, i think the younger generation to look at the world with that confidence saying that you know i am here today confident of dealing with the world or being part of the world we may have had our difficult times you know two centuries uh, the colonial period especially but we are at the end of the day a society which has always been deeply connected to the world and i think we should our prospects are very much dependent on therefore approaching the world with all these aspects in view so you could then ask me saying how are you preparing for it and i would like to share with you a few steps on the you know i've spoken about the domestic changes that's part of preparing all of us but especially the younger generation for the world because at the end of the day you are the stakeholders of this change it's your choices which is really going to determine what kind of nation we are going to be but we can also change you know we can also prepare by changing the landscape itself we tend as i said to sometimes think of us ourselves more narrowly than we should take our immediate region you know we have neighbors neighbors with whom we are so closely bound by history by culture by geography and yet somewhere in our in our collective journey the politics has differentiated us now should we live with those divisions should we uh, at least you know in terms of our collective prosperity are we not better off trying to uh, pool our resources and our capabilities together now yesterday evening uh, in fact you know the prime minister inaugurated uh, a, a fuel pipeline uh, to bangladesh to a place called parvatipur in bangladesh from silchar to parvatipur what it does is the it provides to the consumer to the people of bangladesh access to fuel with all the advantages of scale that india has because as a larger economy with a stronger energy security capability it is our ability to procure and refine fuel and then pass it on to our neighbors which can make a huge difference in their lives 
We had just done a few years ago something similar with Nepal. I give you that as one example. But we are today actually changing the landscape of this region through roads, through railways. Everything that I say is happening within the country is also happening around the country. Now, another way of changing it is, of course, as I said, through key partnerships. Key partnerships with the crucial countries which can offer uh, often provide technology and best practices. And in all of this, one way of preparing ourselves is also to start developing a global footprint. Global footprints do not happen overnight. They take a full generation. You know, today India looms large in its immediate vicinity. We have, in the last decade, a sense of extended neighborhoods. So we look uh, at Southeast Asia, uh, ASEAN as one. We look at the Gulf as another, Central Asia. Uh, and even in the islands in the Indian Ocean, we talk about uh, the, uh, the Sagar policy. But if I am looking 25 years ahead, I have to think where would my interest be 25 years? Where would people be? Where would my businesses be? Where would my services be required? And it is important to start doing that now if it is to mature and be relevant over the course of the next two decades. So you will actually see, it's already happening, Indian diplomacy much more active in say Latin America or Pacific Islands. Sometimes you will ask yourself, you know, why is this foreign minister going to Fiji or I don't know, Paraguay? Because Prime Minister Modi is not asking me to work for today or tomorrow or next week, next month, next year. We want to think Amrit Kal, plan Amrit Kal, prepare the ground for Amrit Kal. And a lot of what we are doing today is actually that effort. Now, every nation obviously would like to uh, shape international relations to its advantage. The stronger ones are more successful. But it's something we all need to do because it's one planet at the end of the day. It's a planet on which we compete and here competition is not a negative word, where we compete to put our ideas, our thoughts, our agenda forward. So some part of this preparation that I talk about is how do you set the agenda? How do you shape the institutions? Now, again, I give you some examples of the last few years. You know, today, I think nobody would dispute uh, climate change is right up there in terms of the collective priorities of the planet. So fine, you know, we go for conferences, we haggle over what are our uh, targets, uh, then complain rightly that we don't get the financing for it. So that's one part of the uh, conversation. But there are things we can do. Now, if you look today at how much solar, uh, solar, the program, solar energy has progressed, a lot of that is due to the fact that at COP21 in Paris, we pushed for setting up the International Solar Alliance today, which has more than 100 countries as members. We can see climate change affecting vulnerable geographies, topographies. We have taken the initiative to create something called the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, so that we build infrastructure for standards which would anticipate uh, possible disasters in vulnerable areas. Or I could look at something very different. Take terrorism. Okay. It is something which has plagued us particularly strongly, you all know why. Uh, but, you know, it's one thing again, yes, we are combating it more strongly, we are making it unmistakably clear that there'll be a cost to anybody uh, who undertakes a terrorist action against India. But there is a larger way of responding to it. How do you constrict it? How do you cut off the financing? 
how do you delegitimize it how do you make it unacceptable in the world conversation that a terrorist action by one country against its neighbor is just another form of statecraft so here too you know how we have created institutions help to shape the agenda now it can also be sometimes in working with other countries uh, i'll give you two examples on either side of india when it comes to the indo pacific uh, we have uh, today uh, we are very active in a mechanism called the quad when it comes to the other side of india we started something called the i2u2 along with israel and uae and the united states so each of these steps is a way of preparing preparing for a world that awaits us but this world as we become bigger we are already the fifth largest economy there are also legitimate expectations of us that we will do more for the world so here too you know it will not happen overnight we have to take the baby steps the bigger steps you know do our region go beyond the region go further off so for last many years for example if there was a natural disaster around us some of you would remember the nepal earthquake uh, you know then there have been some natural calamities in sri lanka something happened in bangladesh in myanmar this was our immediate reach but this year when we saw the earthquake in in turkey you know within 24 hours our uh, our uh, uh, national disaster response team was there and we were able to set up hospitals to deal with you know with uh, those afflicted uh, our our contribution to actually saving lives was something which was very very notable and of course i mean while you do things for the world it's also very essential that we look after our own people already there are roughly 34 million indians and people of indian origin abroad and we have a sense of responsibility obviously much more direct for our own citizens and how does a country deal with this no it was a problem which which actually uh, uh, came up during covid as well because uh, you know i i must tell you a lot of lot of governments lot of officers lot of organizations i won't say they took time off during covid but i mean at least they did work from home okay some of us had the privilege of working doubly from office because for us the covid was a 24/7 activity and there was something which was absolutely pressing which had to be done there and we had a boss who was working triply from office just to make sure we work doubly from office so when we looked at the scale of this challenge and i can tell you at times it was astounding you know there would be a cruise liner which had suddenly you discovered it had 200 crew members of you know of indian nationality who were stuck on some far away place and now expected that they wanted to come home or there would be students you know you know we have today a million students abroad a very large number of countries told students to go home they shut down their hostels and said well you know covid has come time for you to go back now we brought back during that period 7 million indian citizens through something called the vande bharat mission i mentioned that to you not just as an achievement i mentioned that to you as the world that awaits us that when we think of opportunities and mobilities remember there's a responsibility which comes with all of that and this it's it's very important to get this balance right you know no country should ever let its people down but no no smart country will ever make it appear that you are only there for your own people you know each one is an error of of a different kind so we may have brought back all our citizens you know at that time but 
if you look during that same time we also supplied vaccines to 100 countries vaccines at a time when there were stocks of vaccines lying near them which they could not get access to so this you know doing good for the world doing good for yourself these are not contradictory uh, concepts these are part and that's why i said we need that cultural rebalancing because in our culture it is very deep the world is never treated as something as the other as something hostile and finally i think a lot depends on how we stand up stand up for our interests sometimes stand up to global challenges sometimes stand up for others and here too in the last uh, decade you know we have stood up when it comes to terrorism i mean contrast what happened when mumbai got attacked in 2611 with the responses at uri and balakot or look really at the counter deployment that we did on the ladakh border our willingness even today i mean there are troops today deployed round the year at very high altitudes at very low temperatures and to keep them up there and keep them in the right uh, mode to be effective is not a small challenge but it can also be political pressures and you know we've had this big debate on ukraine and there were countries who were securing their interests and asking us to make sacrifices so there was a time and it wasn't again you know i i don't i didn't do this i can say just as an indian issue because i know today a large number of other countries are in a similar mode you know we are preparing for the g20 we were the first country as a g20 chair to consult another 125 countries in the world because we knew that they would not be on the table they didn't have a voice they had very pressing concerns and they had a genuine sense of grievance that their concerns were not being listened to in the world so this is the kind of preparation that we need to do to to prepare for the uh, for the period that lies ahead i am very confident that in this amrit kal we will certainly emerge as a leading power that we would move uh, towards becoming a developed nation and you know the economics points in that direction the demographic points in that direction the the technology the skills point in that direction but sometimes you need an x factor you know an x factor which gives you that additional boost that better stronger compass to go ahead and i think that x factor today really is the vision of the leadership uh, their their ability to understand the world and be ambitious about our prospects uh it i think that x factor also comes from an understanding of the power of technology because i think that is really something which will play an important increasingly important role and that x factor finally comes from being optimistic about ourselves you know there are many debates going on in this country i you know this is not a political forum but to me you know when i look at this i hear these debates at the end of the day the debates for me is do you have an optimistic vision about where india is going or do you have a dark pessimistic vision clearly you know on which side i stand uh, on this so once again i i really thank you today for uh, this opportunity to share some of these thoughts uh, and uh, i i can only say uh, for me these are very very in a way very enjoyable experiences because you know when you go out and represent your country uh, which i must tell you is a very special feeling when you represent the country if you feel if you experience that you are speaking really after having interacted with the future of your country it's a very uh, different sense of confidence with which you deal with the world so once again really thank you for this opportunity
Thank you, sir. On behalf of the Mahe community, I sincerely thank you for the inspiring and insightful words and encouraging our students to pursue greatness in the service of the nation. We have really been enlightened uh, to understand the connections between domestic politics and global influence. Uh, you have uh, explained to us the scale, the implications and the impact of the changes that are happening in our country and how the connection between domestic politics and foreign policy both reflects as well as drives our priorities. The opportunities thrown up by in the post-pandemic world have also been explained uh, in your address and we look forward to uh, more fruitful discussions moving forward. Kindly permit me to ask a few questions on behalf of the audience. Uh, I will also be asking the student who asked the question uh, to please stand up and identify themselves. So the first question is from Felix B. Kutakara, uh, a student of TAPNI. So the question is as follows. What does it mean for India in the broader context of China bro brokering a Saudi Iran truce, does this also blunt U.S. foreign policy in the region? You know, uh, uh, the, the Gulf, as you can see, is a region whose uh, well-being is something of very uh, deep interest for us. Deep interest for us because uh, partly energy, uh, proximity, uh, the trade, but also because something like about 8 million Indians live in that region. So when we see frictions, when we see tensions, uh, sometimes conflict, it is a matter of concern. Now, uh, if uh, Gulf countries uh, are able to uh, mitigate it, the frictions, if they're able to resolve their problems, you know, I, I don't think uh, any uh, anybody would take anything other than a positive view of it. Now, uh, where that mediation process happens, who help, who facilitates what? That's an interesting proposition, because when we speak today about rebalancing in the world, it seems like a very academic concept. You know, it's like okay, your GDP went up by two percent, mine came down by three percent, but it translates itself really into, into uh, behavior of states. So uh, the fact, you know, to me it's not just that uh, China, uh, these two countries went to China and uh, uh, worked out some arrangement. We'll have to see, you know, uh, how that arrangement uh, progresses. It's also the thinking in the region itself that if you see the I mean, at one level, you can say it says something about China, but it also says something about Saudi Arabia, maybe something about Iran as well. And so, so I, I would say uh, it's a very in good illustration of these changes that I have been trying to project. That, you know, the day when uh, there were dominant powers and they would be dominant forever and their writ would run. That whole period is undergoing a change. And a large part of this change will be much more regional, regional developments, regional solutions, regional autonomous players. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Zarika. India has a growing diaspora around the world, which contributes significantly to the country's economic, social, and cultural development. How does the government engage with the diaspora and what role do they play in India's foreign policy? Well, uh, I think, as you can see from my remarks itself, the, you know, the diaspora uh, obviously uh, uh, plays a very prominent role. The diaspora is a big asset and therefore diaspora also deserves to be a very serious responsibility of the country and the government. 
uh, it's not a simple matter because there are many sensitivities involved here. You know, by definition, diaspora lives abroad, it lives in other countries. Uh, there are many complications uh, that arise uh, out of that. But overall, if you see, our effort in the last 10 years has been to connect more deeply with them, to keep that bond uh, with, the, with the mother country strong, to encourage them to contribute in whatever way they are comfortable, to ensure that they have the, uh, the facilities, the, you know, the, uh, the access uh, the, which they, they rightfully uh, deserve. And, uh, you know, and sometimes uh, there are distress situations because diaspora is a, uh, in income terms, you know, it's a, it's a very broad spectrum. Uh, there would be a big part of the diaspora are blue-collar workers uh, who may often require direct support uh, in moments of distress. So we actually have created a fund which has been very effective in dealing with individual cases. You know, it could be, it, it could be people who lost their jobs and can't come back. Uh, sometimes, you know, people who unfortunately passed away, how do you bring the body back? Or, uh, or sometimes even, uh, you know, this ha women who want legal representation abroad. So uh, we, ha I, I would say that degree of, uh, of uh, uh, support and uh, energy, you know, uh, attention they are getting is, is very, very high. But I also want to take this uh, opportunity to plug something on my own behalf, okay? Uh, I have one more responsibility. I'm the Minister for Passports. Okay? I'm one of the few foreign ministries in the world which actually issues passports. And I want all of you to just I'll leave this thought with you because the younger people would not understand necessarily what I'm saying. You know, when I joined the Foreign Service, in my colony, the word went around, okay, there's some guy who's going to be able to get us a passport. Okay? Yeah. Now, and you'll, you'll, the reason for that was those days, it would take months, sometimes years to get a passport. Okay? You actually had to know somebody to get a passport. You had to have somebody in the government who would certify that you are really you in order for that piece of paper to be accepted. Now today, if you look at, you know, uh, I'm proud of one thing where our foreign ministry is concerned. When it comes to digital governance, when it comes to delivery of public goods, I would say the pioneering program on this has actually been the way we have changed passport delivery. But we have changed it in a very uh, innovative way, you know. Uh, we used to have less than 100 passport centers. Today we are more than 500. But I didn't build a single building, okay. What Prime Minister Modi told us was, he said, you know, there are all those post offices out there. These guys don't have enough work to do. So you go and make all of them part of your passport issual services. So today, the passport, the post offices are my passport centers. The postal employee is helping me process passport. It's a very, to me, a very novel uh, way of actually, you know, this maxim of uh, uh, minimum government, maximum governance. It's a very good example of that. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is from Palkin Gupta. What are the strategies for aligning our foreign policy with our economic interests? You know, uh, today our economic interests drive our foreign policy. They're not the only driver, but I would say for sure they are the primary driver. And they are the primary driver because if I, you know, when I spoke about uh, if I were auditing our own history, you know, which are the areas we have done well, where have we come up a bit short, I would say we did not put enough effort into, uh, cent you know, making our economic interest the centerpiece of our interaction with the world. And that's changed, you know. It's changed in, in multiple ways. I, and I, again, will give you an example of that. Uh, la just as we were coming out of COVID, uh, we were very confident that the economy would recover fast because 
we, I, I think we used our finances very, very prudently. We used it to not just support our population at a moment of difficulty, but do so in a manner in which the economic recovery became faster, uh, including through the food support uh, and the various, uh, you know, informal sector support that we did. Now, at this time, uh, in fact, uh, Prime Minister Modi got after us saying, I want you people to really ramp up exports. Okay. Because exports, especially Indian exports, have an enormous employment consequence. So when you are actually pushing exports, uh, you are not just improving your numbers. You are uh, down, you know, uh, at, at the sort of factory level. You are actually creating jobs, you are giving, you are facilitating the process of recovery. So we had something very unusual happen. Yeah. Usually when you do this, uh, uh, this uh, improving the exports, this is the commerce minister's job, okay? So the first thing was, uh, and partly because I myself done the commercial representation abroad in an embassy, I also joined in because we wanted foreign ministry, commerce ministry to work together. Somewhere along the way, the Prime Minister said, he said, no, no, I'm also coming in. And we actually, for the first time in our history, had all our embassies online, with directly the Prime Minister saying, look, this is your number one task. I want you guys, ambassador downwards, to get to work and see how we push up exports. We had set, uh, uh, for, for, uh, on the good side, we set a target of 400 billion, which would have been the highest speed. We exceeded it, I think, by about 10%. Uh, and today, if you see, you know, the export push, the technology push, the best practices push, the collaborations push, you know, when you look at, uh, at uh, how, you know, make in India is done, often by uh, companies who are, you know, coming from outside. I mean, I mentioned Apple. We, we can see this in sectors like medical devices, aviation. Uh, so, uh, so I would say, uh, for me, a much more economic-centric foreign policy is very much the flip side of that change that I was talking about at home. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question from the Department of Languages, Anshula Ravi. Our area of study involves languages, culture, and mediation. As a former diplomat, what advice do you have for us students who aspire to be mediators between different cultures? Uh, you know, look, uh, I am a bad speaker of many languages, okay? Uh, the main reason is uh, actually in terms of, uh, you know, other than uh, English and Hindi, which I studied, uh, in school and Tamil, which we speak at home, uh, the only language I systematically learned was Russian. That is still there in my brain, even if I don't use it that much. I'll tell you the real difference that language makes and why if I had to live my life all over again, is one thing I would do is really take time off and study more languages. It gives you a mindset understanding, which no amount of uh, data or descriptive analysis can actually give you, you know. When, when you, because with the language, there is a degree of culture and thought process uh, that you imbibe, you know, how you deal with each other. I mean, I'm giving you an example of Japanese, which I've learned due to domestic compulsions. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, so the, you know, how you, your language and your etiquette are directly linked. And your etiquette then determines the effectiveness of your uh, diplomacy. So I would be very, very encouraging of people. In fact, I would tell people who are not doing language, so I don't know how your university functions, if you can do a course or something. It may, you may not end up as a language wizard, but I, I really think it's something worth it. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question from the faculty members uh, from the Department of Languages. Isn't it high time that India created its own global media channels to not only counter oftentimes biased narratives and representations 
of India. It's a, it's a kind of a yes and no answer. Uh, it's yes because, you know, the old media uh, still makes an impact, you know. Uh, you'd be surprised how much even today, let us say, television channels uh, actually influence people. Uh, newspapers too, perhaps a little less with the passage of time. So that part of me would say, yes, uh, we should. We have actively thought about it. It's an ongoing debate among some of us. But the other part of me also says, you know, that's like very 20th century. That there is, you know, if you look at the social media world, for which I must tell you I'm still very much a novice, uh, there's, there's a very different world out there. It's a more decentralized world, it's a more contributive world, it's obviously a less disciplined world. So, uh, and it's a world to which Indians take to because it somehow appeals, you know, there's a, there's a, a sort of, uh, I would say, an energy effervescence there that appeals to our individualistic uh, traits. So, I, I would say on balance, yes, as a, certainly as a foreign minister, I would like to see maybe a television channel which projects us abroad. I mean, NHK does it, uh, CCTV does it, RTL does it. Uh, the Americans have done it for many years. Uh, I don't even want to mention BBC. Uh, so, so, you know. Uh, so we have a question from uh, the TAPME faculty. Uh, how are we leveraging our soft power to advance our foreign policy priorities? In very different ways, but remember a large part of soft power is it should not appear to be uh, visibly state directed and government sponsored. The more you do that, the more you actually undermine uh, what, what you are doing. But soft power, you know, people sometimes think very literally that soft power means you set up institutions, you have to propagate your language or your culture. A lot of soft power is actually about narratives. You know, as I said, there is, there is, a, there is a continuous competition to, to actually define what are the broad standards and and even the metaphors and uh, the, the correctness of behavior uh, in the world. So it, it can have many, many facets. And uh, I mean, say, I, I'm now uh, giving you a very direct experience. You know, in some other country, which I don't want to mention, somebody actually asked me this question. They said, you know, we keep you know, you are a country today, you are, at that time we were, I think, sixth or seventh, seventh, I think, largest economy. So you are in the top ten economies, you're very active in foreign policy. He said, I don't know a single Indian historical figure, contemporary figure, you know, we read about the rest of the world. Why is it your history, your heritage, your culture, even your strategy is absent from the global discourse? So actually that is what provoked me to write that chapter about uh, Mahabharat because to me Mahabharat had everything which you could imagine in political science, you know, from balance of power to deception to, you know, political correctness. I mean, there's a range of concepts out there. But the fact is we haven't, uh, and, and to my mind, it will happen. I'm very confident of it, you know. I already see, uh, I mean, I, I have... Uh, uh, in fact, uh, some, I was uh, approached recently saying, why don't we do a conference among the uh, international relations departments of this country? How do we draw upon our, uh, I would say, epics and uh, historical tales to get across the right narrative? But I'm giving you in a very narrow domain. Uh, but I could take it elsewhere. I mean, to me, a very a fabulously successful uh, example of soft power is actually the International Day of Yoga. That 
the smart thing we did about International Day of Yoga, we did not try to micromanage it. You know, we did not try to own it. What we did was, we kind of very softly connected, uh, I would say through enthusiasm, rather than in any uh, material way. Made it a common cause. You know, our connection was, okay, June 21, can we all do this? And you see today the impact it has had. You know, the, the enthusiasts I meet, the, I mean, it is to me, uh, uh, I mean, when I go abroad, the yoga and digital delivery are probably the two most common, except cricket in the right countries, uh, they are actually the two most common subjects of conversation. Thank you, sir. Uh, friends, I'm sorry that we cannot address any more questions. The Honorable Minister is on a very tight schedule. Thank you, sir, for the very insightful and thought-provoking replies and reflections regarding the future of our youth, nation, and the world. May I now, may I now request uh, Dr. H.S. Balal, Pro-Chancellor, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, to kindly present a memento to our chief guest. So we have a very special uh, uh, event now. Our international students who are part of the Manipal College for Health Professionals, as well as the Prasanna School for Public Health, uh, would uh, say thank you to you in their native language. So let me just take this opportunity to call them in one by one. So from the Manipal College of Health Professionals, from Australia, Arshdeep Gill. Australia, we just say thank you. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, good day, mate. Thank you. From Bhutan, uh, Rinzin Wangmo. Um, From Iran, Yazaman Movsagi. From Maldives, Aminat Samahat Sharif. From Nepal, uh, Swisti Sakya. Subha from Kathmandu, Nepal. From Norway, uh, Maria Helen Imogen. From Oman, Kwasi Ahmed Hamid Saif Al Humeri. Sorry for getting From Tanzania, Sikina Sikinder Aldina. Asante Sanasa. The next set of students are from the Prasanna School of Public Health from Austria, Victoria Kundratis.
Danke schön für Ihren Besuch bei uns heute Abend. From Belgium, Melon Ocean Isabel. Uh, merci d'être venu et de nous avoir invité ici. From the United Kingdom, Maxwell Oliver Bursford. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's been a real privilege to hear you speak today. Thank you. From Netherlands, from Netherlands, uh, League Dortmunds. Hartelijk bedankt voor uw komst. From Germany, Anne Hassendorf. Vielen Dank für die interessanten Einblicke. Thank you, sir. Friends, uh, thank you for the wonderful gesture. May I now request Professor Purnima Venkat to kindly deliver the word of thanks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this auspicious event. The TAPMI leadership lectures have had an illustrious history with eminent personalities delivering their keen insights and thoughts to the TAPMI community and future business leaders. Today, we have the fortune of listening to one such inspiring lecture. As we start the vote of thanks, we express our gratitude to the chief guest of the day, Dr. S. Jay Shankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister, Government of India, for his presence and inspiring address. We would also like to thank the Office of the Ministry of External Affairs for their support and help. We would like to extend our gratitude to Dr. Ram Das Pai, Chancellor, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Dr. Ranjan R. Pai, Chairman, Manipal Education and Medical Group, Srimati Vasanti R. Pai, and all Mahe Trust members for their able guidance and support. We also express our gratitude to the Pai family for their encouragement and support. A big thank you to Dr. H.S. Balal, Pro-Chancellor, Mahe, and Lieutenant General Dr. M.D. Venkatesh, Vice-Chancellor Mahe, for their presence today and for their continued support. We thank Pro-Vice-Chancellors of Mahe, Registrar Mahe, and heads of other constituent institutions of Mahe for gracing the event. We thank Professor M.D. Nalapath, Professor of Geopolitics and the UNESCO Peace Chair at Manipal Academy of Higher Education for his support and guidance. We thank Sri Sheshadri Chari for his presence as well. We thank the Udupi District Administration for helping us organize this event. Sincere thanks to Professor Madhu Viraragavan, Director Tapney, for being the leading light and inspirational leader to all of us. Heartfelt thanks to all the Mahe officials and administrative staff of the various departments for their excellent support. We thank the TAPMI faculty members and staff members for their presence and support. We thank students from all constituent units of MAHE and all international students for being a part of the event today. A special word of appreciation goes out to our friends and supporters from the media. We appreciate your conscientious reporting and amicability in placing TAPMI on the national and global map. We thank Master of Ceremony, Professor Jeevan Arakal, for his support as well. Considering the paucity of time, we were able to make a special mention of only a few. But each and every one of you is on our minds as we say thank you to one and all. Th thank you, Professor Purnima. I request the audience to kindly rise for the rendition of the National Anthem.
chief guest will now depart the venue i request the pro chancellor vice chancellor and pro vice chancellor to kindly escort the honorable minister for external affairs to the departure area of the venue the audience is requested to keep standing as the dignitaries depart from the venue